Welcome to the Backyard Professor Chess videos. I'm up here at Big Kahuna up in the Alpine Junction on the Snake River. This is a river a lot of people float. Got some more chess I want to share with you. I'm in the beautiful fall season, September, what is it, 13th or 14th or 15th today? Now well, maybe it's the 16th, I don't know. But I found a quiet little beautiful spot right over here that I'm going to share some chess ideas with you. It's a beautiful setting. Absolutely beautiful country. Look at that scenery. Look at that scenery. Anyway, I know you're here for chess, but I'll tell you what. I love being out in Mother Nature and making my videos. I'm going to set my board up right here. That'll be a perfect backdrop. You guys won't be able to see it, but this is the country I'm in. I'm going to show you a chessboard, not this country. Although I am going to show you the country too. Beautiful thing about chess is it's... There's sameness to it, but there's always uniqueness. And it's fantastic with its infinite variety. A lot of things we learn are the same, but a lot of things we learn are always new. That's the beauty of chess. All right. This is a position Jeremy Soman says, read this chessboard and see what we can find. We're going to realize that black has the superior pawn structure. This is Silman against Burkell. He says, black has the superior pawn structure as opposed to his opponent. And when we look at the pieces, we can see that black's pieces are placed better than white's pieces. There's not a lot of coordination. The queen is kind of loose. She's not protected. There's no protection for the rook here. Uh, He's not as coordinated as Silman's material. Silman has a great knight outpost here. Now, obviously, when we look at how the pieces are coordinated, we can see what Black is trying to do. He's going to take this square, A3. Everything is targeted. The knight the rook is coming down in the open file. The bishop is pointing over here toward a3. So he's going to do what seems to be the most obvious logical thing. He's going to focus on a3. That's his plan. As unimaginative as that is, he says, that's the plan in this particular game because of how the pieces are coordinated. Because he's got the open file, because he's got the diagonal, and because he's got the great knight outpost, this is going to be his focus of power. Because white pawns are really not very strong, and black's pawns really are very strong, that's the side of the board he's going to play on. Isn't that fun to see how reading a chessboard, seeing how the pieces are placed, seeing how the pawn structures are, looking at the weaknesses of your opponent, you automatically, using the imbalances, you automatically know what you're going to do. I think this is the most incredibly cool concept of Jeremy Silman's chess that I have personally ever discovered. Eventually, through time and practice, we can get to where we do this with every single position in every one of our games, and in that way, we're not as lost. What's he do first to coordinate this particular situation? He comes up to queen b6, directly challenging his opponent's queen. Isn't that intriguing? He has a plan, and he has the means to put that plan into effect. What this is going to do is take away the protection of that pawn eventually. He's coming to the queen's side. 
This is eminently logical, he said. Why? Because White's queen is defending the a3 square, right? While Black's queen isn't, at the moment, part of the a3 battle. So, he's going to take a piece of his that is not involved in the battle for this square, his queen, and he's going to take out one of White's pieces that is involved in the battle for that square. You see how the logic here works? This is so intriguing how he does this. Now, the queen doesn't exchange. She dodges over queen c3. So, Silman presses... Oh, whoops. That pawn was supposed to be on a3. Silman presses his rook to a4. Yeah, that's why it's a target, because it's a pawn. Duh. i got to see how to set these boards up. It's early morning. I haven't had my Diet Coke yet which is my substitute for coffee, you know. So anyway, the rook comes to a4. Now you can see him building pressure on this a3 pawn. This is not the only way to continue the threat of the exchange, he says, but it's a very good way. He wants to pull all of his pieces together. He's not going to attack it with just one or two pieces, He's going to try to get his entire army over on that weakness. This is how the masters play chess. Because of the situation on the board, we can identify the weaknesses, and then we can attack them in unmitigated fury to overcome them. It's awesome how he does this. Knight comes up to d3. Rook f comes over to a8 perfectly logically consistent with his plan to take a3, right? Knight f comes up to e5, so Silman's going to the side, and his opponent is coming up into the center. That's a beautiful outpost. It's not permanent. This pawn can come and chase him away, but he's threatening a knight, and he's also threatening the knight that's coming into a3 and hitting a3. So by center development, he actually does attack the wing attack. That's interesting. That's how to approach a side attack. So, knight d takes e5. He gets rid of that knight because he wants his knight here to hit a3. And now, white's knight takes e5, and we see it all over again. Again, the knight is fighting this knight that's attacking a3, along with these rooks, and this bishop. So white is trying to take off the pressure off of his weak point, and black is pouring it on onto this weak point. This is a very important element in our chess improvement, as it were. If these guys can learn how to do this, so can we. That's the encouraging thing about all this. Now, interestingly enough, Silman exchanges the knight on e5 also. He still has three pieces hitting that a3 pawn. Black only has three pieces. So if he can narrow him down, he can get his weakness. D takes e5, of course, the pawn. Now the bishop comes up to c5. Again, making all of his pieces better than his opponent's pieces. His bishop is better, more actively placed. His queen is more actively placed. His queen is doing a defensive role. His queen is potentially doing an offensive role. Both of his rooks on the open file, this rook is a defensive rook, and he, he's, this rook isn't even connected because the bishop's separating. So Silman's position is more amendable to winning this weakness than his opponent's. It's fascinating how he step by step gives us the ways that he's thinking to do this. I love this kind of chess instruction. Queen drops down to b2. Now the queen's going to challenge the queen. And the queen does take the queen because she was protecting a3. 
And now Bishop takes the queen. So now you see Silman has whittled him down to two defenders of the weakness, but he has three hitting him. So Silman's going to win this exchange is what it's coming down to. And in fact, he does. He wins it right now. Bishop takes the pawn. And now Bishop takes the bishop. And now Rook takes the Rook. And of course, he won the exchange. Because Silman had the favorable imbalances, which was the superior development, he had the open file, he was able to put more power on the open file, and because he had a weakness and he targeted that weakness and attacked that weakness relentlessly, Silman won this game. This is a great way to play chess. I've got another example I want to show you. Now, in another terrific example that Silman in his Reassessor Chess 4th Edition describes on the idea of embracing your inner greed. He says this is very important to be able to do, but to do logically. And he shows an example with a couple of players, a couple of master players. Got a queen pawn opening. He's going to fianchetto his bishop. He's going to come into a very strong central pawn position here. C5. Bishop goes to E3, and he's got a question mark at this point. Queen comes up to B6. Knight comes up to C3. C takes D4. Knight comes to D5. Knight goes to D5. He's emphasizing the center. He's putting his knight on a very good central outpost, although it's not a permanent outpost, and he's putting the question to the queen, right? But this bishop can be an absolute monster bishop in this game if he's not careful. Black at this point can embrace his inner greed if he wants to, and Silman gives a beautiful example. Queen goes ahead and jumps down here to take that b2 pawn. Rook comes to b1. Queen takes a2. Now he's wiping out his queen side, right? Rook goes back over to a1. Queen goes back over to b2. Rook <laughs> comes back over to b1. Queen comes up here to a3. Now, at this point, white comes here and puts a fabulous fork on that king and that rook with his knight, right? King has to come over to d8. Knight bumps back down here to b5 to take the queen out. Very interesting, he didn't take the rook, he came back over to here. So queen comes back up here to c5. Knight takes the d4 pawn. He looks like he's wiping black out. And now, bishop takes d4. Now, after the bishop took the d4, now the white bishop takes d4. And now, black goes queen a5 check to the king. King comes up to e2, and Black has knight f6. White has built up a strong center, but Black has completely obliterated his queen side. Now it's true, he's left white with an open file, but the queen is just completely wiping that side out. White has some compensation, but he's two pawns down. He's actually, he's actually in trouble here because his position is wiped out. So Silman says this idea illustrates that there's nothing wrong with embracing your inner greed. In fact, taking material and daring your opponent to prove his compensation puts a lot of pressure on your opponent, doesn't it? Because if the sacrifice doesn't work, the game's over. 
In Block's instance, the sacrifice is working very beautifully, right? The two most famous greed kings are Grandmasters Larry Evans and Victor Korchnoi. These extremely successful players, he says, would take whatever was offered to them and then hang on for dear life. So see, this is another, yet again, another chess philosophy that we can embrace as we learn to understand how to work the different chess pieces together in a coordinated fashion, isn't it? However, here's one of the problems with this concept. I'm going to take the board back to an original to, the, to its original setting, and then I'll show you a new view. So we're back to this position Stillman was discussing after move six. He said, here's how the game actually continued with Black taking the bishop. D takes E3. Now this is interesting because now the knight takes the queen. What is Black doing here? This is insane, isn't it? But watch what happens. Black has an idea here. Now the pawn takes f2 and puts the king in check. <laughs> the king takes f2. He can no longer castle. He's out here in the open now. And now he gets his knight. And the question is, that's right. The issue is in this game, you saw it, white has a queen and the move for two minor pieces and a pawn, yet white's position is far from easy to handle. Let's have Mr. Mayo himself explain his logic, what he did. This is the black pieces player. Here's what he was thinking. This is intriguing for us. For the queen, Black has an ultra-safe king, he has two minor pieces, he has an extra pawn, and he has almost total dark square control. Also consider the lovely squares Black gets for his minor pieces, the e5, the e6, the c5, and the c6 squares. And he says, White has a displaced king. His development is deficient. In fact, white has no development here. And a horrible light-squared bishop with no active prospects. You see the two white pawns here? Makes this a bad bishop. His bishop's not going to do anything. He's faced with the immediate loss of two more pawns. Do you see how? Bishop can take b2, and his queen is confined to defensive duties now because of this. One other critical factor to be considered, according to Mr. Mayo, is that white does not have a single effective pawn lever at his disposal. He does not even have the prospect of an active exchange sacrifice to alter the position. Only perhaps passive sacks in short, Black's pieces in this game are going to be more active than White's pieces. And, he says, White has no way to break into Black's position, but Black has the way to come and get White. So, this is an effective discussion of the imbalances in this position, isn't it? And you would think, well, Black's going to lose because he doesn't have his queen. But watch how Black exploits the imbalances. This is fantastic how he does this. Queen comes up to d2 to defend that pawn, absolutely. Knight immediately comes up to c6, and he's got a square right here he's going to look at. Knight comes to f3. Knight comes to f6. So now all the horses are out, right? Bishop comes up here to d3. You notice that bishop's not going to be very effective in this game, right? Knight comes over here to g4, immediately putting the king in check. See, this is the problem that white has, is his king is very vulnerable. King moves out of check, and black castles. 
Now he puts the question to the knight, get out of here. Knight comes over here to e5. This knight takes the knight at e5. So now he's getting rid of some minor pieces, and now the knight, rather than exchanging the knights, comes down here to d4 and puts the king in check, so now the king has to move again. Now, bishop takes e5. Isn't this interesting how black's pieces are more active while white's king has to shuffle in and out of check, black is bringing more pieces into this game. Isn't that fascinating how based on the imbalances, he's working this thing really good. Rook h comes to f1. King goes to... Whoop. Yeah, rook h to f1. And then d6, supporting his center. Now king goes to g1. He's trying to finally dodge his king out of the game here. Bishop comes up here to e6. Black's going to run him over. Queen comes up here to b4, trying to get a little more active, although she doesn't have much scope right now, because the knight comes back up here to c6, challenging the queen and closing off any lanes the queen might have. She comes up to b5. Rook comes up to a5, chasing the queen again. You see how this works? First he chases the king around. Now this poor queen is getting clobbered, getting chased around. And in the meantime, he's developing all of his army and putting the point to the, to the white player. This is fantastic chess. And he doesn't even have a queen. And he's doing this without the queen. Now look at this. Rook f to a8. He grabs that open file. A3 comes up to try to stave off the onslaught coming on. And now he and he's got the double pawns. You think they're weak? No, they're not weak. They're coming in full bore. When you can move double pawns, that's power. So he goes to B5. Now Queen dodges down to C2. B takes C4. You notice how Black is just slowly taking over this board. This is fantastic how he does this. And he doesn't even have the queen. But he knows how to read the imbalances of the board. And he knew based on that he was going to be able to chase the king and the queen all over the place. Bishop d4. King comes to h1. Knight comes over here to e5. He's just coming on full board. Rook A finally gets to come to D1 to grab somewhat of a, of a threat in the center. Bishop dodges back up to C5. Rook F comes to E1. Notice that White is playing strictly a defensive game here. This is so fascinating. Now he brings his other pawn up to B5. You remember that used to be doubled pawns. Now he's marching forward. And he's got a powerful queenside side, right? Queen comes back up to c3. Rook to a4. He's slowly putting the squeeze on him. Rook comes to f1. His rooks can't do anything but go back and forth in a defensive meandering. In the meantime, black just keeps marching forward, putting the pressure on. A finally takes b4 here. This is a fantastic illustration of the power of the imbalances and how to make use of them. Now look at these two open files here that he's got. This is a complete wipeout. Rook has to come to a1 to challenge the open file. There's no question about that. Rook comes over to b8 to double the file. Rook comes up to a2 to guard the weakness. Rook finally comes down to b3 on an outpost. This is incredible to see how this systematically eliminates White's offense. Black is just like a virus. He's, he's like glue. He's coming down on him just as carefully and slowly as he can. Now he comes zipping over here to rook e3. Queen goes back over to c2. He pushes the pawn to c3. <laughs> this is incredible, right in front of the queen, right? B takes c3. Bishop takes a2. 
He's got a rook. He's up the exchange now. Even though he's lacking a queen. And now rook takes c3. You can see black has systematically, completely wiped out white's queen side. This is an amazing display of the power of using your imbalances. This is one of the best I've absolutely ever seen. Bishop finally gets up here to e6. Rook comes over to f8. Bishop to d5. King to g7. He's tightening everything up. Queen comes up here to a6. King comes over to, whoops. He pushes the pawn against the bishop e6. Bishop takes e6. He's trying desperately to get some counterplay here. You see how he's trying to do this? He thinks his queen is going to win his game for him, and it's not. And now his rook takes f8. King takes f8. Queen goes to c8 check. King comes to e7. Queen goes to b7. Knight to d7. Queen to a8. Rook to e1. King to h2. Bishop to g1 check. King to h1. Bishop to d4 check. King to h2. Bishop to e5 check. g3. And finally, rook comes up to e3. And white resigns. <laughs> this is one of the most intriguing chess games I have ever seen because of the queen sacrifice and based on the analysis of the position and the way Mr. Mayo, the black pieces player, the way he analyzed the imbalances on the board and then utilized those imbalances in his favor, he won this game without a queen, right at the beginning of the game. That's a great illustration. So, Anyway, I've probably gone over my 30 minutes for these two games. I hope I can squeeze them in. Thanks for watching the Back Up Professor Chess videos. Happy chessercising, happy checkmating, and I will see you next video.